So here, we're going to talk about the different types of receptors. And when we talk about any type of receptor, um, it's important to know what category it's going to fall into. There's going to be two main categories, the cholinergic receptors and the adrenergic receptors. And I drew in here, all the cholinergics are going to deal with acetylcholine, and all the adrenergics will deal with everything else, such as dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. Uh, we'll go through the synthesis of both acetylcholine and dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine uh, in a different video. Um, but for now, we're going to start with um, the very, very, I guess on your screen, it would be the left side of the screen, um, nicotinic receptors. So nicotinic receptors are going to be a subtype of cholinergic. So nicotinic and muscarinic both deal with acetylcholine. So that's where we're going to start. So over here, we have the basics of a nicotinic receptor. Um, you can see our phospholipid bilayer with, uh, uh, drawn in, and then we've got a channel here, which is going to be a transmembrane protein, um, and that's going to represent our nicotinic receptor. So um, a key point to remember is a nicotinic receptor is going to insert itself into the phospholipid bilayer, and it's going to be an ion channel. Um, so like I said earlier, nicotinics are a subcategory of cholinergic receptors. And all cholinergic receptors are going to deal with acetylcholine. So there's our acetylcholine. It's already been preformed. Um, it's going to go find its target. So its target is going to be this uh, nicotinic receptor. And the nicotinic receptor is made up of five different subunits. Uh, acetylcholine is specifically going to bind the alpha subunit. There's a couple alpha subunits. It's going to bind the alpha. And once found, this typically closed channel is going to open. And once, once uh, acetylcholine binds, we've got our sodiums extracellularly. Um, they're going to go through their gradient inside the cell. So acetylcholine is going to activate this ion channel to open, releasing sodium down into the cell into its concentration gradient. So uh, let's go over where nicotinic receptors are found within the body. So notice here that I drew in a couple other subtypes. Within each nicotinic receptor subtype, there's an NN or an N sub M. So let's go over what the differences are. So we're still dealing with nicotinic receptors, which are going to be cholinergic uh, receptors ultimately dealing with acetylcholine, ACH. So let's look at NM and NN subtypes. Um, so let's start with N subtype M. M, I like to think of standing for muscular. So the NM receptors are going to be found on muscles. So we have a nerve here and it's going to find its muscle that it's going to innervate. And at the receptor here, that is going to be an NM receptor going for the neuromuscular junction. So we've got the nerve and the muscle. So all muscle junctions, they'll still deal with acetylcholine. So we haven't changed our uh, receptor, the nerve is still going to secrete acetylcholine. The only thing that's different is now we have an NM uh, receptor at that muscle junction. And that's going to cause contraction. Uh, we also have another subtype. Um, this is not going to be found on muscles. Instead, I listed the two places that this is going to be found. So the N subtype M N receptor. Um, autonomic junction. Uh, kind, of, kind of sounds a little scary. Um, it's actually pretty easy to interpret. So using my example here, here's the brain. Uh, it's going to go down the spinal cord and eventually you're going to have a nerve that leaves. Um, the autonomic junction, so let's break the word down. Autonomics. Um, where did we see something like this before? Well, we know that our autonomic nervous system is going to be our fight or flight or our parasympathetic. So our sympathetic parasympathetic system. That's what autonomic stands for. So we got simp and parasympathetic. Uh, so, and then we have junction. So the junction where our brain and spinal cord meet our autonomic system pretty much. So um, we have our spinal cord right next to the spinal cord we've got our sympathetic chain. And within that sympathetic chain, you're going to have ganglia, or where our, um, our, where our pre-ganglionic and our post-ganglionic nerves will meet. So if we've got an organ over here, let's say this is our adrenal gland, 
uh, let's use a different organ. Let's see, that's, that's going to be our stomach. Um, so we have two different nerves. We've got our pregangliotic nerve, which means that there's the nerve before this ganglion, where it will meet, and a postganglionic nerve. So the subtype of receptor that's going to be found within this autonomic ganglia is going to be the N subtype N receptor. So we have our preganglionic nerve coming in. We have our postganglionic nerve. So uh, we can throw out pre uh, pre sympathetic or preganglionic sympathetic nerve, preganglionic parasympathetic nerve, preganglionic sympathetic nerve, whatever combination you want to use, um, the subtype where our pre and our post meet, they will use N subtype N receptors. So they're still going to deal with acetylcholine. Even though these post ones might be producing epinephrine or norepinephrine, they might have target end to target organ effects upon the organ with the adrenergics uh, the autonomic junction is always going to be N subtype N. And then finally, our adrenal medulla. This is going to be one of the few times where a presympathetic is going to directly innervate an organ, and specifically, it's going to be an N subtype N. So let's draw in our little diagram here. We've got our brain, we've got our spinal cord, We've got a nerve coming out of the spinal cord. We've got our adrenal gland, not the stomach anymore. Um, that nerve is going to go. It's going to innervate the adrenals. What type of receptor are we going to find? Well, two locations, the N and N is going to be, and one of them is going to be the adrenal medulla. So this is going to be one of the few times that you're going to get a sympathetic effect due to a nicotinic, also acetylcholine, uh, neurotransmitter. We just covered nicotinic receptor subclass of cholinergic receptors. Now let's look at the other one, muscarinic. Um, I am going to write in uh, muscarinic has three types, M1, M2, and M3. Um, there are some other ones, but these are going to be the three main ones to talk about. So let's take a look here. Uh, we have our acetylcholine, which is our neurotransmitter, which is going to come in We've got our phospholipid bilayer again, and then we've got this funky transmembrane kind of goes down in, out. Uh, it's a transmembrane protein. That's going to be our G-related uh, G protein. So acetylcholine is going to come, it's going to bind to this transmembrane protein, and it's going to activate our G protein, which is going to be intracellularly. Um, the thing that I would like to point out is this G protein can be one of three things. It could either be GS. It could be a GI, or it could be a GQ. And what does that actually mean? Well, GS is going to activate uh, your cyclic AMP, CAMP. Uh, GI is going to inhibit your cyclic AMP. And GQ is going to increase your phospholipase C. So um, we are going to get to all those later. Right now, I just want to focus on muscarinic. So, We've got our acetylcholine neurotransmitter, binds. It's going to activate either the GI or GQ. So if it's an M2 receptor, so if this was an M2 receptor, we know that this G protein is going to be an inhibitory GI protein. Um, and that's going to decrease CAMP levels within the cell. That's going to deal with your M2. Let's change this to now an M1 receptor. If it's an M1 receptor, our acetylcholine is going to bind just like it is before, except this time we're at a target organ that is expressing M1 receptors. Um, our target organ is now going to have M1 receptors activate the GQ protein intracellularly. It's going to go off and do its thing by activating phospholipase C. It's going to trigger a cascade of events within that cell. You'll also find this effect with M3 proteins as well. So let's find out what target organs actually contain the M2 and the M1 and M3 protein uh, receptor subtypes. So we 
just talked about the mechanisms of the muscarinic receptor. Now let's go into where these are found. So I listed here all these target organs. So that's going to be the organs where the M1, the M2, and the M3 receptors are going to be found. And just for your reference, I did include what type of uh, G protein that each one is including. So let's take a look at the first receptor, muscarinic receptor subtype 1. Um, those are going to be found mostly in the enteric nervous system, and they're going to be involved in increasing gland secretion within your intestines. Um, also, they're found within the CNS, um, not as important. But then let's focus down on uh, M2, and this one's a little more important than M1. M2 receptors are going to be found in cardiac muscles. And what that is going to do is an M2 receptor is going to decrease the heart rate ultimately. So it's going to decrease the conduction uh, from the SA node to the AV node and ultimately delay your heart rate. Um, and then finally, this one's going to be the most important one, and I actually threw in a little uh, big one. And uh, why do we care about M3 receptors? Well, this is going to be um, mostly dealing with your wet picture. And for the wet picture, what I mean, smooth muscle is going to contract. So it's going to cause um, the intestines, the smooth muscle within the intestines to contract, and it's going to increase your GI motility, causing increased diarrhea and sometimes vomiting. Um, also, we've got increased secretions, so mix that in there with your smooth muscle, um, increase in your GI peristalsis. Um, it, it leads to a wet picture both, at both ends. Um, also, it leads to pupil constriction and lacrimal tear production. Um, so you're going to be crying, you're going to be vomiting, you might be diarrheaing. Um, also, it's going to affect your bladder, causing your bladder to contract using the detrusor muscle, and uh, which is uh, also going to have your sphincters relax um, when you activate this, so you'll be urinating as well. Um, one thing that I do want to point out is going to be dealing with blood vessels. Your sympathetic nervous system is going to vasoconstrict. However, it's going to be your M3 receptor that is going to deal with vessel dilation. So um, you're going to have a wet picture and you're also going to vasodilate um, as a result. So when you think of muscarinic receptors, if you have an agonist, meaning that it's going to activate your muscarinics, you're going to be thinking mostly about the M3 receptor. You do have to worry about slowing the heart rate too much, um, but when you increase your gastric secretions, when you increase your stomach secretions, when you increase your um, eye secretions, and all of your glands, your secretory glands, um, it's going to lead to a wet picture overall. So now we're done dealing with acetylcholine and the cholinergics. Now we're going to switch over to adrenergics. And adrenergics are going to deal with norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine. Um, but these are the two that we're really going to focus on. So we're going to deal first with alpha and beta adrenergic receptors. So we have adrenergics, and then you've got the subcategory alpha and the subcategory beta. Um, what does that actually mean? Well, you've got it further, further broken down into alpha 1s and alpha 2s, beta 1s and beta 2s. Um, as a little key here, here's what the GS, GI, and GQ proteins do. GQ is dealing with phospholipase C, GI is dealing with adenyl cyclase, and it's dealing with uh, decreasing CAMP levels for inhibitory, the uh, adenyl cyclase. And then GS is going to stimulate that to secrete more cyclic AMP. So, Alpha 1s, if you have a target organ that expresses alpha 1 receptors, um, those are going to be GQ proteins. Um, likewise, alpha 2 receptors are going to be GI proteins. Um, and then finally, betas, both of them deal with GS proteins. So let's take a look at what organs express these receptors. Okay, so we just talked about the mechanism. Now let's go to the end target organs that express these different receptor types. So again, we've got the alpha 1 and 2, beta 1 and 2. Um, I tried to color coordinate it so you can see which one has what type. So let's start with alpha 1 receptors. Uh, your eye has alpha 1 receptors. And when that alpha 1 receptor is activated by epinephrine or norepinephrine, uh, the eye will dilate. Um, that's going to be in contrast to the muscarinic receptors that we showed earlier, which will constrict. 
Um, also, blood vessels will express alpha-1 receptors. When an alpha-1 receptor is activated by the blood vessel, it's going to lead to vasoconstriction, increasing your blood pressure. Um, and then lastly, um, we've got the bladder expressing alpha-1s, and that is going to increase your sphincter tone, which is going to decrease your urine output. Um, contrast that to the muscarinic 3s, which we saw earlier, which led to the wet picture. Um, that was going to be loosening of the sphincter, and then we've got tightening of the sphincter with the alpha-1. So those are going to be antagonistic effects. Um, I also want to note out that these are not a comprehensive list of all the end target organs. These are just the main ones that I think are important. Um, Alpha-2s, on the other hand, are going to be seen in the pancreas. Uh, it's going to decrease insulin production. and also going to be found in prejunctional uh, synapses, causing a decreased neurotransmitter release between the two, so you'll have decreased um, effects. And then finally, you've got beta-1s. This one is actually going to be an important one um, because it's going to be dealing with the heart. We saw muscarinic 2s, uh, M2 receptors, were dealing with the heart when we were dealing with acetylcholine and the cholinergics. Now we're dealing with adrenergics, so we're going to be dealing with beta-1s. Um, beta-1s are going to be the exact opposite of muscarinic 2s, and instead of decreasing heart rate, now we're going to increase traction, increased conduction, and ultimately increased heart rate and cardiac output. And then finally, we've got beta-2 receptors. These are also important. Um, a little clinical pearl, when you give a beta-2 agonist to someone who is having an asthma attack, you're going to be dilating their bronchioles. Uh, so if someone comes in with severe uh, asthma and their airways are constricted, they'll give a beta-2 agonist to uh, help vasodilate or bronchiodilate. Um, also, it acts upon the uterus to cause it to relax, and also it has some effects on blood vessels, causing them to dilate. Um, those are the end target organs of the adrenergics.